Uh, this is the video for now on the circulatory system. Uh, we're going to look at these uh, three areas here, uh, blood pressure, blood velocity and cross-sectional area. Uh, basically what this video is about is looking at those three things as uh, blood travels through uh, the circulatory system from the left ventricle. Okay, we're interested in the left ventricle because that's where blood uh, pumps out of the heart and goes around the body. Uh, so we're looking at how the blood pressure changes from the left ventricle all the way down to uh, the pulmonary, sorry not the pulmonary, the vena cava, okay, which is the vein. Uh, we're going to look at how the, the speed or the blood velocity changes and then the cross-sectional area is to do with the uh, the blood vessels uh, themselves. So uh, it's an overview really of those three factors and how they change as you move from the left ventricle uh, ultimately I suppose back up to the right atrium which is where the vena cava uh, goes to. So uh, it's going to be quite a, a detailed video, there's a lot of important information uh, going to be covered in this. Uh, as always you need to make your own notes, uh, present them in a way that is useful to you, that you can learn and revise from. Um, I'm going to start off uh, by showing you a graph that shows the changes in these three factors in red, the blood pressure, the velocity and the cross-sectional area. I'm just going to give a description of the changes to start with, uh, which shouldn't take us too long. And then we're going to go in and look at the explanations um, as to why and how uh, blood pressure, blood velocity and cross-sectional area change throughout the uh, circulatory system. So, um, this uh, graph that you can see now, um, this shows uh, the changes in blood pressure, blood velocity and cross-sectional area as you go from the left ventricle okay, to the aorta or the large arteries. Okay, there are other large arteries in addition to the aorta, but if we just assume it's the aorta for this uh, uh, talk. Uh, then we go to the small arteries and the arterioles, then capillaries, venules, then the small veins and the vena cava. And of course it's the vena cava that goes back up to the right atrium. Okay, so uh, as you can see we're going to look now just at a general description as to the change, firstly in uh, blood pressure. So with the uh, with the left ventricle, you can see that uh, there's rather large changes uh, in blood pressure. Um, those blood pressure changes are due to the contraction and relaxation of the ventricle. So right at the top here, um, that pressure there would be about 120 millimeters uh, of mercury. Um, that's the uh, the unit that we use um, uh, for blood pressure. Okay, we use millimeters of mercury. Okay, so 120. Uh, you know, it can vary in people, but the standard value is 120. Okay, so it goes there, and the pressure in the ventricle will then go to zero uh, millimeters of mercury. Okay, so you get big fluctuations there in um, uh, pressure changes. Okay, right, uh, the next one is looking at uh, the aorta. You can see that the blood pressure there uh, still fluctuates, okay, but it doesn't fluctuate as much as uh, in the left ventricle. Um, as you go to the small arteries and the arterioles, again, uh, it's still fluctuating, but overall the pressure is uh, is decreasing. Now, this fluctuation sort of carries on, really, until you get to the arterioles, okay? But again, you can see that the pressure is still fluctuating, or sometimes we call it pulsating. Um, it, it's generally decreasing. Now... 
Um, when you get to the capillaries, uh, you don't get any pulsating or fluctuating of the blood pressure. Um, it's smoothed out, if you like, but you get a massive drop uh, in pressure there within the capillaries, and uh, that pressure uh, carries on reducing all the way to the small veins and uh, the vena cava. Okay, so that was the general description of the <coughs> blood pressure changes. Uh, now we're going to look at the blood velocity, which is the blue line. Um, this sort of follows the same trend, really, as the blood pressure. You can see that the velocity of blood is very high uh, in the uh, aorta, large vessels. Uh, we're not going to discuss the left ventricle for this. The blood velocity, we're just looking at that as it flows through the various blood vessels. So it's very fast uh, in the large <coughs> vessels. It then um, drops as it gets to the small arteries and the arterioles, and you get a massive drop uh, in blood velocity in the arterioles, as you do actually with the, the blood pressure. Uh, the blood velocity is at its slowest in the capillaries. Okay, so you get this big drop there. And uh, the blood velocity will slightly increase as you go into the venules and the small veins and the vena cava. All right. Now, um, even though there's a slight increase in pressure there, it's, uh, it's still very low. Um, sorry, the, the blood velocity is still very slow uh, in the... Uh, veins okay so that's the general trend there of the uh, blood velocity okay the cross-sectional area then uh, in green uh, again we're just going from the aorta uh, it's very low all right and it will increase as you get to the arterioles and you'll get a massive increase uh, in the arterioles and in the capillaries Okay, so that peak there represents a very large cross-sectional area. Uh, the cross-sectional area will then drop as it goes into the venules and the small veins and the vena cava. Okay, so that's the general description of that graph. Uh, we now need to go into the explanations as to why these factors change. Um, as I do, I will be using this diagram here on the right. Uh, we saw this in the previous video. Uh, so I want to link up my explanations with the graph and this uh, diagram in the remainder of this video. So what you should do is maybe uh, draw out a summary table um, of the description of that graph, okay, to put in with your notes. And you need to do the same now with our uh, with the explanations, uh, which will be the remainder of this video. So on this slide, uh, we're going to look at the explanation of um, the changes in pressure in the left ventricle and the aorta. We're going to sort of do these together because they are very much linked. Uh, <clears throat> so first, uh, let's look at the uh, the left uh, ventricle. Now on the diagram here, um, this region here is the left ventricle, okay, in both diagram one and diagram two. Uh, in diagram one, what's happening is the left ventricle is contracting, okay. So uh, the major thing you need to know there is that the volume is reducing, okay. And if you compare diagram one with diagram two, you can see that there's a volume difference uh, because diagram two, the ventricle is actually relaxing. It's getting bigger uh, in terms of its volume. So anyway, back to number one. Um, the ventricle is contracting. Okay, so the volume of that ventricle is reducing. And uh, we should know the relationship between volume and pressure. Uh, if you reduce the volume you will increase the pressure and that's what's happening here and that's why we get um, a value up here of about 120 millimeters of mercury 
it's due to the contraction of the ventricle where the volume of the ventricle reduces so the pressure increases so you get a maximum pressure of about 120 millimeters of mercury now when the ventricle relaxes as i said a moment ago the volume increases and that causes um, a pressure to go to zero now the reason it goes to zero is that the ventricle has completely emptied of blood so there's no blood in there uh, to actually cause a pressure okay so that's why the uh, peaks or the troughs really here go to zero okay um, so there's the explanation of the pressure changes in the left ventricle okay diagram one shows contraction diagram two relaxation so the peak is contraction and the trough there is relaxation where there's no blood left in the ventricle right um if we go on now to look at uh, the pressure in the aorta all right now the top part of diagram one and diagram two shows the aorta all right in diagram one it's showing blood being forced into the uh, aorta from the left ventricle okay as the uh, ventricle contracts okay the second diagram shows what happens in the aorta when the ventricle is relaxing. So we need to explain now the differences in these two diagrams and uh, what the arrows um, represent, both the black and the red arrows. Okay, so first then, why does um, the pressure in the aorta uh, fluctuate or pulsate uh, it's simple enough it's really again to do with the effect of the left ventricle when you have a peak in pressure in the aorta that's because the blood has been forced into the aorta when the ventricle is contracting when the pressure drops in the aorta that reflects the fact that the ventricle is relaxing so you've got lower pressure in the ventricle okay so that's why it fluctuates there it's to do or it fluctuates in sync with the left ventricle contracting and relaxing okay so just to repeat when you get a higher pressure it's due to the ventricle contracting and forcing blood into the uh, aorta when the pressure drops is to do with the fact that the uh, ventricle is relaxing okay so um, what actually happens when blood uh, enters the aorta well this is shown in diagram one to start with um, to point out now these uh, lines here they are the aortic semilunar valves and they are open uh, that is because blood is being forced from the ventricle into the aorta. Now, when the blood goes into the aorta, it is coming in at very high pressure. It'll be about 120 millimetres of mercury, approximately. Now, the aorta is an elastic artery, so it will expand. It'll stretch to accommodate the... Uh, extra blood that's being forced into it and these black arrows here represent the pressure that's being forced against the wall of the aorta okay and that's what's causing it to stretch okay so when this stretches here um, that relates to that part of the graph here that's where you get the, the higher pressure. It's about 120 millimetres of mercury, and you can see, I hope, that it corresponds with the pressure in the ventricle. 
okay it may actually be a little bit higher if I'm honest but uh, these values are all approximate right so um, that's what happens when you get the uh, high pressure there now in diagram 2 what has happened is because the aorta is elastic um, it's undergone this recoiling so the elastic fibers have snapped back to their original shape to their original length and the aorta is no longer sort of expanded it's gone back to its original uh, dimensions okay now the black arrows in this diagram you can see they're pointing in the opposite direction to one in uh, uh, diagram one this shows that the pressure now is forcing the aorta wall to go back to its original configuration and when it does that some of the pressure that forces the the artery to go back to its original shape oops go back to that side it forces uh, the blood to move along the aorta so this red line here shows that blood now is being forced along the aorta okay and that's due to the pressure uh, created by the artery wall returning to its original configuration all right so the important point there is that it allows continuous flow of blood through the aorta despite the aorta getting blood from the ventricle only when it contracts okay so it just ensures that blood continually flows away from the ventricle down through the aorta so that's what that red line is showing there and to repeat myself that blood can flow because of the elastic recoil of the aorta okay forcing the blood further down the aorta now the other thing that happens when you get elastic recoil is uh, you get a little bit of backflow of blood now that's what this little red arrow is there okay so as well as blood being forced away from the ventricle a little bit is forced back towards the ventricle now here the aortic semilunar valves are closed so that will prevent blood going back into the ventricle from the aorta okay so important point there is the aortic valves close to prevent backflow of blood into the left ventricle okay so uh, there were quite a lot of important points uh, covered uh, up until this point so make sure that you're writing these down in a format that you can learn from there is another point we need to make about the aorta um, and it's the fact that even though the pressure does drop in the aorta uh, and again that's because the, the ventricle is relaxing uh, it doesn't go to zero like the pressure in the ventricle does so we need to know why this pressure never goes to zero and the answer is quite simply because there is always blood in the aorta it never empties of blood there's always blood in there and one thing that keeps the blood in the aorta is the closure of the semilunar valves all right so that's an important explanation as to why that pressure never goes to zero in the aorta okay right that I hope um, is okay for you that's the explanation for the left ventricle and the aorta <clears throat> in terms of how the pressure changes uh, we now need to go on and look at uh, the small arteries uh, the arterioles and the capillaries okay and that's uh, this slide okay arterioles and capillaries then um, 
If we look at the graph, um, again, we can see that in small arteries as well as arterioles, you get this pulsating effect within the vessel. Uh, but the pulsating is a lot less. You got, you, you know, the, the, the peaks and the troughs are a lot sh uh, shorter. <coughs> now, uh, as well as that, the overall pressure uh, is decreasing. Now, why does that decrease? It's purely to do with the fact that smaller arteries and arterioles are much further away from the heart. Okay, so it's a distance effect here. Uh, so the effect of this large pressure change within the left ventricle is not as pronounced in the vessels further away from the left ventricle. Okay, so the, the left ventricle in effect has less of an effect in vessels further away from it. So that will explain why the overall pressure drops but it also explains why this, this pulsating or fluctuating also is a lot less extreme. Okay, so um, why does the pressure uh, reduce so dramatically in arterioles and capillaries? Because you do see the greatest drop in pressure within um, the arterioles and the pressure within the capillaries um, is uh, a lot lower than that in the arterioles. So there's a big drop from a small artery to an arteriole and there's a drop again from the arteriole to the capillary. Uh, so why does this uh, happen? Okay, one of the explanations is to do uh, with, with this branching effect. So if we look at this diagram Okay, we're interested um, at this point, really. There. Wrong. We're interested to there, sorry. Ignore that. Uh, we're just interested in the arteriole region, which is there, and the capillary region, which is in the slightly darker brown. Now, what you can see is the... Uh, arterioles are branched. There's not just one arteriole. Okay, you've got a branch there, branch there, branch there, there and there. So what's happening is um, when you get this branching effect, you actually get an increase in this cross-sectional area, which, which is in green on the graph. All right, now I'm not going to explain cross-sectional area in this uh, slide, so we'll leave that for the moment, but just, just know that the cross-sectional area increases. Now, the capillaries are even more branched than the arterioles. Uh, the branching of these capillaries is absolutely immense. You can get thousands and thousands of capillaries within an organ or a capillary bed. Um, so the branching is a lot more extreme uh, in the capillaries, okay? And as such, the cross-sectional area is a lot greater than in the arterioles. And you can see that with the green line on the graph. You get this peak in cross-sectional area in the capillaries. So why does this increased cross-sectional area uh, reduce pressure? Uh, well, again, it's to do with uh, volume and pressure relationships. Within the arterioles, uh, because of them being branched, you have an increase in volume. Therefore, you'll get a slight decrease in pressure. As you go to the capillaries, the volume of all of those thousands of capillaries is immense. Therefore, the pressure drops. Okay, so it's that inverse relationship between volume and pressure. Uh, in this case, as the volume increases, the pressure drops. Okay, so that's one important explanation uh, for this drop in pressure as you get to the capillaries. Okay. Now, the other... Um, explanation is solely to do with the capillaries. 
the capillaries um, in order for them to do their job they must have the ability to lose liquid from the blood okay so as blood flows through these capillaries they can allow uh, what what we call the plasma part of the blood that's the uh, the liquid part of the blood uh, to be forced out okay so you actually get uh, a loss of liquid from within the capillaries now if you've got less liquid in the capillaries you ultimately have or you will create uh, a lower pressure okay thing is you see the um, the pressure the pressure within any vessel uh, is ultimately caused by the liquid that's in it okay so if this is a, a, a standard vessel here um, the liquid within that vessel is going to be pressing against the wall of the vessel um, and that's what creates the pressure now if you're going to get liquid leaking out if there's less liquid you're ultimately going to get uh, less pressure we will just have tiny arrows in this one now because it's lost liquid so the, the the pressure has reduced because there's less liquid in there to create the pressure I suppose a good analogy of that would be like a tire okay if a tire has a puncture the air leaks out and the pressure because uh, sorry the the tire becomes flat it has no pressure in it all right so it's something similar happening in the capillaries they're not losing air they're losing liquid and therefore they're going to be losing uh, pressure so that's uh, a unique thing there that um, happens in the capillaries now in the next video we're going to look at what goes on in the capillaries in more detail um, and why the capillaries lose this uh, or allow liquid to leak out of them okay so that's the arterioles and uh, the capillaries done okay lastly uh, for this video um, we f with regard to the pressure anyway uh, we need to look at uh, venules and veins okay so uh, venules and veins then these now if you look at this um, diagram again where my arrow is uh, the the venules are what uh, form from the capillaries okay so again just like the arterioles they are branched you don't just get one uh, venule you get many um, so those venules can then go into um, a small vein and ultimately the small vein can then lead to the vena cava which is the main vein that goes back to the right atrium so what you can see is uh, with the red line the pressure continues to fall uh, and it's at its lowest really in the vena cava now why is the pressure lowest in the vena cava um, it's on okay if you if you think back to the other videos where we looked at heart structure and the blood vessels to the heart the vena cava is on the right side of the heart which is the low pressure side of the heart that that part of the heart doesn't generate a great deal of pressure because blood is only pumped to the lungs so um, this this generally is on the low pressure side of our circulatory system okay now the other reason why the pressure continues to low uh, to, to become lower is uh, the cross-sectional area is still quite large all right now I'm going to explain cross-sectional area later but for now just accept that the vena cava in particular has quite a large cross-sectional area um, okay so that's why the pressure um, can uh, reduce within the vena cava you can see um, that the green line you know is not down as low as the aorta all right and it's because veins uh, as we said in the blood vessel video veins have a larger diameter lumen okay so again it's to do with volume okay they've got a larger volume compared to an artery and therefore the pressure 
uh, is lower. Okay, so there's two aspects there. It's large cross-sectional area again, and it's due to the fact that the veins are on the low pressure side of the circulatory system. Uh, so the pressure uh, is uh, is very low uh, as it moves through the um, uh, vena cava. Okay, we're going to look now at the blue line on the graph, which is the uh, blood velocity uh, and how that changes. Uh, the first thing to, to, to note down is that the the velocity or the speed of the blood, how fast it flows, is ultimately dependent upon the pressure within the blood. Okay, so if you get, uh, or if you have a high pressure, you're going to get a very fast velocity of blood. And that's why if we go to the graph in the aorta and um, the start of the small arteries, uh, you get a very rapid velocity of blood and that's due to the pressure forcing that blood rapidly through the vessels. Now <clears throat> as the pressure decreases and one thing that decreases pressure is the distance away from the heart uh, you can see that the blood velocity reduces so as you get to the uh, small arteries and the arterioles and the capillaries okay the pressure drops quite dramatically and one reason for that is the distance from the heart but it's not the only uh, reason okay um, okay so the other the other cause of the drop in blood velocity um, as we go particularly through the arterioles about there and into the capillaries is to do with this change in cross-sectional area. So I've brought in this uh, diagram again and uh, you can see that the arterioles are branched, the capillaries are branched, so um, as we said previously there's uh, a larger volume therefore the pressure reduces and if you have a reduction in pressure the actual velocity of blood will reduce. So please make a note that it's also to do with cross-sectional area increases as you go into the arterioles and the uh, capillaries. Now the other cause of the drop in velocity okay, is to do uh, with the very narrow nature of the lumen uh, of the arterioles and the capillaries. Okay, we've spoken in a previous video about the diameter of uh, lumens and so on. Now, the the narrowest vessels really are the capillaries, and the arterioles are, are still quite narrow, but the capillaries are the narrowest. Now, when you get a narrow capillary, you actually get an increase in resistance um, to the flow of blood. Uh, basically when you get a narrow tube you get incredible friction forces occurring. Uh, so as the blood flows through a very narrow capillary or a narrow arteriole there is a lot of friction between the blood and the wall of the vessel and that friction is going to slow the velocity of the blood down quite dramatically. Okay, so that's another reason why you get this drop in velocity in the arterioles and the capillaries. Each individual capillary, there may be thousands of them, but each one is incredibly narrow and that will increase the frictional forces and ultimately slow uh, the blood velocity down. Okay, um, lastly then, the velocity changes now as you come out of the capillaries into the venules and the veins. Now, the velocity does slightly increase, all right? Um, it's still very slow, okay? I don't get the impression from the graph that the, the speed of the blood flow in the veins is very fast. It isn't, but it is faster than in the capillaries, 
okay now what causes that increase um, in velocity um, well it's to do with less resistance uh, occurring in the uh, particularly the, the the small veins uh, again the the diameter of uh, uh, the lumen of the veins is going to be uh, increasing so you're going to get less resistance to the flow of blood you're going to get uh, a lot less friction occurring uh, so that that can help sort of increase the velocity a little bit but uh, we often say that the the, the 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 blood flow within the veins is sluggish okay and uh, again it's it's due to the fact that there's very very low pressure in the veins okay so you're not going to get rapid movement of blood in veins okay it does increase from the capillaries uh, but that's more to do with the, the the frictional forces being lower okay right um that's the uh, velocity changes uh, within the circulatory system lastly now we need to look at um, this cross-sectional area aspect um, which is more accurately expressed as total cross-sectional area because what we're looking at is um, certainly when we come into the arterioles capillaries and venules we get multiple vessels so we have to take into account the cross-sectional area of each vessel okay so i've drawn out a uh, simple diagram to help show the change uh, that the green line is showing okay the green line is total cross-sectional area so this uh, vessel here is going to be the uh, aorta okay then we're going to come here i've left out uh, small um, arteries i've got here the arterioles which are branched okay then we go to the capillaries again there can be thousands and thousands of capillaries in a capillary bed so i've got lots of circles there to represent capillaries the venules uh, the venules are going to have a slightly larger cross-sectional area uh, than the arterioles okay so here are the arterioles here are the venules and then this is uh, would be the vena cava and the lumen of the vena cava is slightly bigger than that of the aorta okay so its cross-sectional area is slightly higher okay so that that's how it relates uh, to the green line okay um, so you get the lowest uh, cross-sectional area in the aorta okay the highest in the capillary and then slightly lower then in uh, in the veins okay so i've just written in uh, the names of the the vessels in this diagram okay um i've shown also the uh, i've color coordinated them the red is oxygenated blood the blue is deoxygenated and this little region here the orange bit is showing the transition from oxygenated to deoxygenated blood so um, hopefully that diagram shows the concept of cross-sectional area now I've mentioned cross-sectional area a couple of times in relation to um, uh, blood velocity flow okay so I just want to highlight that um, you can see here uh, from the venule to the vena cava uh, there is a slight increase in uh, cross-sectional area all right that is going to uh, aid um, the velocity of blood it'll increase it a bit because there's less friction because these vessels are all bigger than the capillary vessels so with the capillary you've got high friction in each vessel uh, in the venule the friction is a bit lower because the vessel is slightly bigger and then to the vena cava massive lumen um, and the frictional forces are very very low 
okay so that's why you get a slightly increased blood velocity in these vessels but again it's still not very high okay I think that's everything we need to cover now for this uh, video um, make sure that you've written some sort of summary table maybe some summary diagrams to uh, organize all of this information that I've covered okay there's quite a lot uh, covered in this video okay but hopefully um, you you've understood uh, this graph now uh, in more detail